Well, if you didn't know, we are almost at the end of the church calendar. Um, we are only two Sundays away from the beginning of Advent and Christmas season. Yes, I know some of you, Thanksgiving doesn't really exist, and we've already have our Christmas trees up, and that's fine. Um, but at least in the church calendar, we still have two more weeks before we prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus' birth. And so, um, the last Sunday in the church calendar is always Christ the King Sunday or Reign of Christ Sunday. The day that we remember that Christ will return and um, he is on the throne and has triumphed. Um, yes. Um, and so, we're going to spend two weeks just thinking about that concept together um, and looking at and considering thrones and our loyalties and leaders and things like that. So, to get us started, we're obviously going to do something silly because that's just how I like to do things, I guess. Um, so there's going to be a little quiz. You're going to be okay. It'll be fine. Take a deep breath. Um, and what's going to happen is on the screen will be a crown of some fictional character. And your goal is to try to think of the name of the character and the movie that it's from. Okay? I have prizes for people who get things right. Yay! Yay. Okay. Does anybody not understand what's about to happen? Okay? Alright. So, can you recognize the monarch by their crown? So, some of these are kings, queens, prince, princesses, right? See if you can spot them by their crown. This is number one. Does anybody know? Ursula. Who got? <laughs> I, I see a very passionate hand over there, too. Yes, Phoebe, what would you say? It is Ursula. Well, I heard two people get the right answer. You guys can get prizes up front here. So, Phoebe, if you want a prize, you can come up front and grab one. This is Ursula from The Little Mermaid. Now, technically, this is a little bit of a stretch because she um, crowns herself. Okay? Uh, that's technically King Triton's crown, but I digress. Uh, <clears throat> Alright, number two. If Gerard were here, he would know it. <laughs> I thought this one would be hard. Josh? It's Joffrey. King Joffrey. What's, yes, from, from Game of Thrones. Just a little disclaimer, just because we're using a picture of a king does not mean I endorse their behavior or any storyline arcs that they uh, do in their TV shows or movies. Okay, well, that's all right, everybody. It's all right. Shake it off. We'll, it, hopefully, we'll get better from here. All right, number three. It's a cartoon, yes. Not Flintstones. <laughs> no. Nope. I'm surprised by this one. Heather and Josh have already seen these, so I can't actually uh, pick their answers. But this is actually the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland. You recognize her now, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh. All right. All right. Number four. Wonder Woman. Not Wonder Woman. Not, not Cleopatra. These are fictional. Um, man, apparently we don't have enough nerds in the church. Yes. We gotta work on our nerdy group. <laughs> this is actually from Lord of the Rings, uh, specifically the Return of the Kings. This is King Aragorn. Doesn't he look handsome? All right, number five. 
their guess is there's, this person is connected to ice, definitely. But note that this is live action, not animated. Not from Frozen. Not from Frozen. Oh, it's, is it the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? It is from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yes. Now, um, the title of this character is a little fuzzy because she refers to herself as Queen Jadis, but everybody else refers to her as the White Witch. So, that's, I heard some, oh, that's a crap. I really didn't think this was that hard. I'm sorry, guys. I got a prize for at least knowing where it's from. <laughs> Say that again. Do I get a prize for knowing where it's from? Yes, you get a prize for knowing where it's from. Okay, there are both edible and non-edible prizes up front here. And then just for fun, there's a bonus one. Does anybody recognize this one? Right here. Ruthie? It is Anna from Frozen. This is Queen Anna, and technically it's from Frozen 2, but yes, this is Anna from Frozen. Spoiler alert, she becomes queen at the end. Her sister abdicates the throne to her. So, I know. Shoot. Well, um, you know, I have to admit, I thought it was going to be harder to do real historical crowns. Like, I looked up, like, um, different uh, kings and queens from England, and, but the problem is some of them use the same crown, it's just slightly modified for their own purposes, you know? And so I had to scrap that and go the, the fictional route, but I love stories of royalty or monarchs, whether they be historical or fictional. Um, there's something about their stories and the struggles of somebody who's ruling and the pressures that are on their shoulders that can be quite fascinating. And as today we are preparing for Christ the King Sunday, next week it seems appropriate to consider different monarchs and things. We will be diving into a text today, um, and as we consider the words of Jesus here, Jesus is encouraging us to consider loyalties to consider loyalties to different rulers, etc., in our lives. And so, not only kings and queens require our loyalties, but in many different facets of our lives. So, I encourage you to turn with me to Mark chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8 and consider Christ's royalty and the loyalties that pull us away from him. Okay, this is Mark 13. As Jesus left the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look what awesome stones and buildings. Jesus responded, Do you see these enormous buildings? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when these things will happen. What signs will show that all these things are about to come to an end? Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many people will come in my name saying, I'm the one. They will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and reports of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must happen, but this isn't the end yet. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other, and there will be earthquakes and famines in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. Okay, there's a lot to unpack in this, so let's take it one step at a time together. So, just before this passage, Jesus and his disciples are hanging out in the temple. They see a poor widow come and offer her last coins to God. And there's this contrast here of this rich, lavish building where people are worshiping God and there's lots of money pouring into the church and the Pharisees fancy dressed and proud of themselves and this woman 
vulnerable and in poverty, giving her last coin, her everything to God. And Jesus uses this moment to critique the scenario and even call out the Pharisees about their ignoring their responsibilities as Jews to protect the orphan, the widow, the poor, the immigrant. Those were part of their laws to protect the vulnerable. And now it's like he has this disciple who's not been paying attention, who's like, wow, this building is beautiful. And Jesus is like, yep, it's a pretty building, but uh, this isn't gonna last forever. And um, he seems to be tempering their their expectations and their loyalties, because even we can have loyalties to a building that distract us from the callings that we're supposed to have as Jesus' followers. Example, just before that, ignoring the needs of a widow that are right before you while in the midst of this beautiful space. And so they take this walk towards the Mount of Olives, which if you ever go to Israel, you'll know that from the temple to the Mount of Olives, if you're on foot, it probably would take a couple hours to get there and to sit down and look at the... um, the temple from that place. So whether or not this other disciple who initially exclaimed beauty in the temple is with them or not, the the gospel denotes that there are four disciples sitting there going, okay, Jesus, you just said some really scary stuff back there. Could you clarify, please? I'd like a date and a time so I can put it in my calendar and make plans. And Jesus responds, by saying, don't be misled by by false teachers. He doesn't give them the date and time. He doesn't give them the specificities to prepare themselves. Instead, he uses this as a teachable moment about how they're supposed to live their lives right now, what they're supposed to do moving forward. Watch out that no one deceives you. Now, what's interesting that if you don't know much about church history, you may not know that what Jesus is saying in this moment actually happened. In 70 AD, which Jesus' death, crucifixion, resurrection was in the mid-early 30s AD, okay? So 40-ish years later, the temple gets destroyed. Uh, The Jews had been rebelling against Rome, and Rome was finally like, we're done. They come, they destroy the temple, and people are scattered. And the temple is never rebuilt again. Um, And so, so that really does happen in 70 AD. What the disciples at this moment don't know is a lot of them will have already died by martyrdom by the time that happens. So maybe Jesus doesn't respond to them about date and time because it's like, uh, you're already going to be dead, so it doesn't matter. (laughs) I don't know. Uh, Maybe he's calming them down in that moment. But but what they're saying and what what they're hearing sounds like the end of the world, especially because right before this, Jesus has been talking to them three different times about how, hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to die and be gone. I won't be with you anymore. And then all of a sudden he says the temple's going to be destroyed. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you're gone and the temple's gone, like, is there anything going to be left? What's the point of living if both of those things, like the things that we hold so sacredly dear, are going to be gone? Oh. And Jesus is like, no, 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 we're not going to stop living. Stay faithful. Destruction, scary things will happen, but stay faithful. This word that Jesus is sharing here is the beginning of what the scholars call the little apocalypse, or Jesus predicting when some big destructive things are coming. And um, it gets confusing how he, the language he uses, because of it, some of it sounds like it's happening in that moment in history, like 70 AD. But sometimes when Jesus talks about the end, he's referring to Christ the King Sunday when we talk about, woohoo, he wins. Good, good wins, evil's done, yay. Um, and so they overlap a little bit in the language he uses. But here in this moment, 
Jesus prepares them for something that's coming that will feel like the end of the world. And as I thought about this, I thought about how frequently every generation, really from Jesus' time on, has these events where it feels like the end of the world. Where there are people on the street going, the end is near, read the signs of the times. Every generation has people like that. You think um, back to like World War I, the war to end all wars. And then, but then there was World War II. And then we had Vietnam and 9-11. And now we have COVID. And it feels like each of these things on their own for an individual generation feel like the end of the world. Like, God, how do we keep going? We've lost so many people. It feels like we've lost hope and stability. And Jesus keeps saying to be faithful. <sighs> now I have to ask, okay? The disciples ask, when will this happen? My question to you, feel free to answer out in, in this moment. If you were able to find out the date, time, and method of your death, would you find out? Is there anybody that would say yes? yes maybe. Or maybes? Any maybes in the room? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> and so the majority of you would say no, we wouldn't want to know? No, there's a definite no. <laughs> You'll have to do it in her day <laughs> yes, can, I, can I put it in my calendar? If you received the, the date of your death, what would you do? Try to live a lot before. Live a lot before? Mend broken fences. Mend broken fences? Trying to change the path? Trying to change the path? Yeah. Okay, so if I die of heart disease, Maybe if I just skip all the cupcakes <laughs> and uh, abstain from bacon, I could live a little bit longer. Exercise a lot. Yeah, exercise a lot, baby. Um, sometimes I think that if we knew that date and time, it would cause us to pause and to freeze and maybe even live in fear. Like, oh, someday I'm going to die. <sighs> or maybe it could lead us to, to frivolous lifestyles. Um, Queen Latifah has a movie about, like, she, they, they scan her, and they say she has a terminal brain tumor, and it turns out that there was some kind of scanning flaw, but she goes hog wild. She cashes out all of her money and spends it all, and, like, just lives big. And, you know, I, it sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? Um, but I think that it's a mercy that we don't know. I think it's a mercy and a challenge of faith to just live each day going, well, I guess I get this day, or at least this moment. <sighs> That's great. Thanks. Thanks, God. And to be grateful for it. Um, I feel like if we knew when the end was coming, whether it be the end of the world um, or the end of our lives, it would change the course of what we did. And I don't necessarily think for the better. I think um, it may turn and twist our priorities. Now, I see in, in the movies that we mentioned in our um, little quiz, there were different interactions people had with these rulers. Um, some of them didn't become rulers until the very end. But like in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's a character named Edmund, and he meets Queen Jadis, and befriends her and uh, submits to her authority because she sounds like she's going to elevate him above his siblings. And like, woohoo, I'm going to be better than my big brother. That's great. Definitely. I will do whatever you say. Even when it's questionable. <laughs> and um, in the, the books for the Lord of the Rings series, we learn about hobbits, these halfling human beings, they're creatures, that intentionally live in a bubble 
Um, they live in the Shire, and they ignore everything around them. They don't want to know what's going on there, because it doesn't have to affect me. I'll just live in my happy little bubble, and I'll be fine, and it'll just be my own thing. That's called foreshadowing, for the record, if you read the books. Um, because it does affect them later. The evil present in the world even gets to the safe little bubble spaces. And then there are leaders who don't always have the best motives in mind. Yes, the Queen Jadis from um, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobes, but also um, um, the Queen of Hearts. She really just wants people around to entertain her and give her her every whim and desire and make her feel good. Um, and then one that we didn't mention in there was from Robin Hood, the, the animated, okay? Um, there's, a, there's Prince John in there, and he taxes and steals from his subjects to benefit his coffers. You know, he makes himself wealthy at the expense of his people. And I know these are all fictional characters, but they also portray caricatures of us in life. Like, that um, the way leaders can act towards people. The way their motivations may not be pure, even if they sound like they're good people. The, line, the, the queen from Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, she portrays herself as the one true queen and looks powerful and fancy. And so Edmund does whatever she wants, but you find out quickly that, no, no, she's got some twisted motives and wants to um, defeat the one true king and uh, just squash all of her subjects. <sighs> loyalties are a fickle thing. The loyalties we have to um, society can, we don't even realize sometimes our silly loyalties. Uh, for example, what is the best burner on the stove? Do you have a favorite burner on the stove? Front right, anybody? Front left? Front right, yeah, okay. Yes, there are people who have favorite burners. Yes, it's true. It may be a surprise to you. What about Coke or Pepsi? Yes, and you can fit the diets in, into the whichever camp as well. Coke, okay. I know better than to ask about favorite sports teams. Yep, we'll just avoid that one entirely. Um, one that Josh suggested was your favorite McDonald's. Like, is there a better McDonald's? There's a slower one. There's a slower one, okay? There's one to avoid. <laughs> yeah, maybe you won't even choose uh, those. Then there are other silly loyalties like iPhone or Android, um, Windows or Mac PC, you know, uh, when it comes to your computers and things like that. We, we have these loyalties that pull at us, not, not even to mention the fact that there are leaders who are pulling for our loyalties as well, right? And we don't even know their motivations. We know what they say to us, but we don't know their intentions in mind. You know, these, these, uh, Soda, sure, it sounds like something delicious to drink, but really, it's just a sugary carbonated beverage that is not healthy for us. Yet we have very passionate, sometimes, opinions about, oh, if that, if that restaurant serves Diet Coke, or they serve Coke instead of Pepsi, I'm getting water. I'm not, I'm not getting, is Coke all right? No, it's not all right, I want a Pepsi. <laughs> I grew up in a Coke household, for the record, so um, they even have, my parents have a glass bottled Coke machine in their back porch, so there are very strong opinions about that in my family. But the way we pull our loyalties and how they divide us, it, it distracts us from the intentions that God put us on this earth for. In the story of Jesus walking and talking with his disciples, there's even a moment where loyalty to a building distracts them from the roles they're called to do as the people of God. Their loyalty to this fancy, ornate space, and they're like, wow, the temple of God is gorgeous. 
It's like, yeah, but did you notice that there was a person that needed you as God's hands and feet right there sitting in front of you? We don't even realize when our loyalties distract us from the intentions that God places before us. And so in this moment, Jesus doesn't give them the date and the time. Instead, he says, pay attention to your loyalties. Pay attention to the teachers who are trying to distract you. Many will say that I am the one, but they're not. Lots of terrible things will happen in this world, and people will say they know what's going on, they know the right path. But unfortunately, they have other motives in mind. So this moment, I want us to consider if we as Christ followers are able to be critical thinkers. Can we test all of the leaders or brands even that are asking for our loyalty? Can we test them against the story of Christ and weigh whether they are worthy or not? Can we tell the difference between false teachers or false rulers and the one true king? Next week, we are going to look at the image of the one true king and dive in deeper into being able to tell the difference between the one we follow and those who will lead us astray. Step one today is for us to at least take a moment to reflect to think about those loyalties, to think about the people who are saying, follow me, I know the truth, and to compare them to the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and to say, oh, you know, their words match, but their actions don't. Or their actions match, but their words don't. Or, and to assess and compare them to our one true king. And any leader or brand or anything else that tries to take the number one spot for our loyalty is missing the point. Because that spot is reserved for Christ alone. So as we prepare for Christ the King Sunday, it also prepares us for the season of Advent and why we get excited about the birth of this baby. Why we get excited about that story? Because Advent starts the story of God's intentions and um, where things are going, and then we continue on through Christmas and Epiphany, and it tells the story of Jesus' ministry. And then the second half of uh, the church calendar is about our role in all of this. We get to Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit is dispersed on the people, and then God goes, your turn! And we're in that time now, <laughs> waiting for Christ to come back, waiting for Christ the King Sunday to historically happen and not just be celebrated in the church calendar. And until then, we are called to be loyal to God, faithful to his calling. So I invite you back next week so that we can explore that together. Um, and before that, you'll be all full because we'll have a fish fry before that happens. So you definitely won't sleep in the day, day, you know, Christ the King Sunday, even though your bellies will be full. You'll be able to show up and we'll be able to test all words and leaders against the one true king. Because it's important for us to be equipped and defense against anything that could distract us from our Savior. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you don't tell us the day, the time, the method of our end. We thank you that each moment is instead a gift given to us that we are to be grateful for. Lord, help us to be intentional with our moments that we are given that we are able to remain loyal to you and that everything else is tested against your truth. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray.
Amen. We are going to close this service with our benediction, and so I invite you to stand and join hands as we sing our closing benediction.